Welcome to rest. Circle, circle, dot, dot. Now I got my to piece together this broken glass. Our God runs toward, not away from the mess. Think about that. We're talking about the creator of everything. Good morning, Rest Church. How are you guys doing today? Good. Hey, just uh, first off, I want to say a couple congratulations to some people that you may or may not know. Uh, first, Danny and Deb are new grandparents recently, so congrats to them. And then, uh, yeah, and then uh, CJ and Kate uh, brought in brought their new baby Uriah into the world this past week, so congrats to them. And um, and uh, the Beasley Rainey family welcomed their newest addition uh, just a couple days ago, too. So congrats to them, too. Uh, what I'm saying is that if you're a first-time guest here, there's a baby coming to a seat near you soon. Uh, man, if, you're, if you don't want to be pregnant, probably don't drink our water here. I'm just, just, I'm just saying, I'm just putting it out there. For you on that, it's like we inherited the world's worst roommates all together at once. Uh, but they're so cute, we just let them stay, you know. Man, my wife and I were in that same boat. We we're getting ready to welcome our second baby boy uh, here in. Uh, I said three weeks earlier in the first service, but that is not correct. So it was a little bit before that, um, about like two and a half ish weeks. He's coming this way, and if it's okay with you, I just want to do some confession this morning. If that's all right. Is it okay? So, I've done a terrible job in preparation of him getting here. Like, compared to my first son, Jackson, the prep work that went into him coming is way, way exceeds the prep work for Jordan on his way here. And I've, I've looked, but I couldn't find one excuse on to why I, I haven't uh, prepared as well. And so I've just, I've kind of... Uh, Settled into the fact that I'm your average guy, okay? And uh, as an average guy, uh, I know some of you are soon to be and, and coming to be new dads, and so I wanted to give you some dad advice uh, really quick, if that's you. This is how you pick up your baby, in case you're wondering, the right way and the wrong way to do it. Uh, just some free dad advice I'm putting out there, but uh, I'm just that average guy, and so... Um, this morning, I have a, a Jason, come up here for just a second. I want to talk to you for just a second about the average guy. Now, Jason, he's just being a good volunteer. Just come stand up here, Jason. Um, but I wanted to use Jason and his, uh, his mountain of manliness to explain to you guys the average, the average guy this morning. And uh, Jason's outside of a lot of these categories um, that I'm going to tell you about, but the average guy, he's about <laughs> five foot nine. The average guy is uh, about 172 pounds. The average guy has around 100,000 hairs on his body, except for Johan. The average guy, <laughs> they're there, <laughs> other places. They're, the average guy, the average guy, he he, he has about 33% of his body's water. The average guy, about 7% of that is his head. And some of y'all are like, that's my husband. That's my boo right there. He got a big noggin. Y'all can relate. The average guy, he says about 7,000 words uh, every day. And, and interesting, I found it really interesting in this study, this 2018 study that I was reading, the average guy, you can hear him up to a distance of about 200 yards away. But on a, a, a still night over water, you can hear him at about a distance of 10.2 miles. And some of y'all are probably like, that's closer to my husband, dad, brother, or son. They are really loud. But I'm sharing this with you, the average guy, because this morning in our, in our text, we don't get much of a description of our main character. But what it is, is it's the story of four guys. It's the story of four guys who come... And they're, they're coming to bring their friend to Jesus. Now, in this story, we don't, get, uh, we don't get told their names. We don't get told where they came from. We don't get told if dad bods existed back then. We don't know much about them in the story. But what happens is these four guys come, and they load up this guy that has paralysis, that he has palsy. And what they do is they struggle to get him in front of 
of Jesus. So he has no way to get there himself. He can't get up and walk himself. So what they do is they have to struggle to carry the man to Jesus. That's great, guys. He set him down. And so we're going to go to Mark chapter 2 this morning. And if you would, just grab your Bible and go there with me. But I wanted you to get a really clear picture of the struggle in this story this morning. Mark chapter 2. Uh, we'll start in verse 1 and we'll go through uh, 12. Let's give it up for our handsome men volunteers. This is one of my, uh, my favorite stories in the Bible, Fresh Church. And uh, I'm really excited to, to preach it this morning. And I just want to ask you, do you love Jesus, Rest? Yeah, are you excited to study His Word this morning? All right. So we'll jump right into this. Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 1, we'll go through 12. And when He, Jesus, returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that He was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And He was preaching the Word to them. And they came bringing to Him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof that was above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes that were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they question within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? I mean, which is easier to say to this paralytic that your sins are forgiven or to go rise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose immediately and picked up his bed and went out before them all. So that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this before. The truth is, you and me, we came in here with a lot of different struggles probably this morning. And some of them may be really big ones. You may have just found out that you or someone you love has cancer. Or you may have experienced a death recently. Or you may be stressed out because you just lost your job. Or maybe your struggle isn't quite as big as that but it's still a struggle. Maybe this past week you put your foot in your mouth. Or you, you said something or did something you really wish that you could, you could take back. Or you just have a lot of stress going on. I'm not trying to demean or, or, or marginalize or sa- sideline your struggle this morning. But I want you to know that in the midst of all of those struggles, there's actually a greater struggle that all of us have that, that can result in separation uh, from our great God and King, Jesus. And it renders us spiritually dead. And so the title of my sermon this morning, if you're taking notes, is this, The Source of the Struggle. The Source of the Struggle. And my main point is really simple. It's that Jesus, he, he uses broken people like you and me to rescue broken people like you and me. So let's pray. Let's pray together this morning and then we'll, we'll break it down. God, you know the, the circumstances uh, of everybody's situation this morning. And you know um, what we came and brought in here with us to this place. And Lord, I'm, just, I'm so encouraged by the story in Mark that, that despite the man's weakness, you said to him, get up and go. And Lord, we are just itching to, to pick up whatever... Matt is sitting under us and paralyzing us this morning to follow you. Lord, I want to pray for the, uh, the, the children, the students at McCracken, all throughout McCracken County, God. Um, Lord, thank you for loving them and just showing them the gospel. We pray that each one of them would come to salvation. And Father, um, just lastly, I thank you for all the babies coming here to Rest Church. Uh, what, a, what a picture of your grace. And help us all, God, to get really great discounts on diapers when they arrive. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 This, uh, this short section in Mark is one of the most vivid, it's one of the most memorable stories throughout the whole gospel account. And our text, it starts with Jesus, and he has just returned from his preaching tour throughout Galilee. He's been healing and preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God that is the person of 
himself. And so verse 1 says, When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. He, Jesus, has returned once again, and the news has went viral. Everyone wants to see what they've been hearing about. Jesus has been out teaching. He's been out doing miracle after miracle, healing different people. And everyone is gathered back together again to hear and see what Jesus has to say. Now, we said in previous weeks that the area that Jesus is in right now, it's, it's a, a small population, anywhere from 150 to a max of like 1,500. And I don't know if you know this, but um, I'm from a small town. And there is this really interesting thing about the way that small towns, uh, the way people communicate information in small towns. Uh, it's like, you know, everyone parks at that parking lot at Walmart. Or everyone goes to the Kmart parking lot and you just chew the fat with your neighbor, really because there's not a lot else to do there, you know. Boredom is a really, really lethal weapon. And so this very, very big news in this very, very small town it would have everyone leaning in, <laughs> leaning in to hear and see what Jesus was doing. And so long before there were newspapers and social media and uh, TV cameras, uh, there was verbal process of communication between people. Now, to set the context before we really break this down, I need you to know that in the Gospel of Mark, this section, Mark chapter 2, verse 1, goes actually through Mark chapter 3, verse 6, and it operates as a single unit. Tell your neighbor, it's only one. And what it is, is it's a story of five controversies between Jesus and the Jewish religious elite. Five controversies that happen between Jesus and the Jewish religious elite. And this is story number one that we're going to look in at this morning. So verse number two, let's jump right into it. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, <laughs> not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. As we learned a few weeks ago, people are, are gathered again to see and hear about Jesus and what all he's done. But they're not primarily there necessarily to listen to his preaching. But they're there to see these miracles that everyone's been talking about. They want to see what they've been hearing about and there are so many people that show up in this place. The text literally says that there's not even enough room at the door. The doorway is jam-packed, full of people. It's standing room only. And so the people here, they weren't waiting for Jesus to teach in the synagogues. Instead, they decide to bring the synagogue to Jesus. And Jesus' response to the crowd isn't a miracle. Instead, he, he, he says that he is preaching the word to them. Now the word here is the logos. It's the reason. It's the message about the kingdom of God and how it is invading earth through the person and work of Jesus Christ. He's preaching that message to them. And he's, what he's doing is he's proclaiming the Old Testament scriptures to all everybody around. He's proclaiming our Old Testament, that is. Now, soapbox moment for just a second. I've heard some really well-intentioned Christians, maybe some of you, uh, talk about, we don't need the Old Testament anymore because it's old, you know, and it doesn't relate to us, us New Testament kind of people. And I just want to tell you, look, I understand your intentions and stuff, but that's, that's actually wrong. Because Jesus said that he didn't come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill it. And our, our scriptures are incomplete without the Old Testament church. In fact, if, if they're good enough for Jesus to preach a message about them, they're good enough for us too, Amen. Now this, this crazy thing happens. Verse 3, listen to this. And so they, they came, bring to him Jesus, a, a paralytic carried by four men. Now this is crazy. Jesus is preaching his message. Everyone's listening. And, and all of a sudden, in the middle of Jesus' sermon, these four guys come in with this man who has palsy. We're not told in the text what kind of palsy that he has, but palsy is a degenerative disease, and it typically is associated with tremors in the body, and it's like a short circuit from your brain to some limbs most of the time. Now, people who have palsy today, they can still walk most of the time. In this man's case, it's extreme because he's paralyzed. He can't walk anymore. So this is an extreme, extreme case. <coughs> the problem, though, 
is that because of the crowds, verse 4, they could not get to, near to him because of the crowds, they can't bring their friend to get the VIP access with Jesus that they're looking for. They can't get them in front of Jesus. And, and, and what do you do? What do you do? Well, these four, undeterred, they roll him up like a taquito and take him outside to get him in front of Jesus. They are determined. They're not letting anything stand in their way to get their friend in front of Jesus. Church, God uses broken people to rescue broken people. And that's what we see exactly here in, in our text. And honestly, we've probably all been in a similar spot before where you were determined, where you were on a mission to accomplish something and get something done. I told this story a few weeks ago, and if you aren't here, this may be new for you, but my four-year-old not long ago swallowed a, a ball, a gooey ball at Yaya's Island, and he had to be rushed to the ER. <coughs> I find out about this, get there, my wife and uh, her mom are, are, are there hanging out with our son Jackson, and you know, he's just sitting there like nothing's happened. But, of course, me, uh, uh, dad alert goes off. And I'm trying to figure out what kind of ball this is because I need to know if it's toxic or not. You know, if it can hurt him or not. And so what I decide to do is I'm going, I'm going to be on a mission. I'm going to Yaya's Island to retrieve a similar ball myself so I can find out and bring it back to the doctor. Well, I go to Yaya's Island and I get with the manager and I tell her what's going on, my situation. And... And she walks back to the back room and she comes back out. And when she came back out, I knew we were going to have some problems. Because she came out with this huge roll, Rolodex of keys. Like she had just beaten up a janitor. I mean, there were so many keys on it. And we get to the machine and she's, she's you know, key by key trying to get into it. And, and, and she doesn't have the same sense of urgency about her that, that I have. And so i got to get her on the, my level of urgency. And so your pastor was losing all of his pastoral patience, to say the least. And so I look down at her and I, I say, I'm going to give you one more minute and then I'm going I'm to break this glass. <laughs> In the nicest way possible. I mean, I was on a mission. There was a sense of urgency there, right? Because, I mean, you can mess with me and I can get over it. But if something or someone is messing with my kids or my wife or my church, like we got some problems, you know. And so I'm, I'm, I'm ready to load this thing up if I have to, you know, to take it and put it in my truck. Uh, to, to get it out. It's a can't stop, won't stop kind of urgency moment. I'm sure you've had a moment like that, a mission moment. And so these four guys in our story, they have that same type of urgency to get their friend in front of Jesus. So they begin to carry him up step by step outside up to Peter's roof. It was probably Peter's house that they were all at. Now, we know a little bit about this uh, because typically a peasant Palestinian house would have been a one-bedroom house. And its roof isn't like mine or your roof. And instead, it's a flat roof that would have been made out of mud and clay and branches woven together over top of each other. Typically, you would replace these kind of roofs annually. And the only way to access this roof was there was an outside staircase that led up to the top. So these four friends carry their other friends step by step up to the flat rooftop. <laughs> and so since it's flat, you can easily walk on it. And conveniently enough, you can dig through it. Check this out, verse 4. They removed the roof above him. And when they made an opening, they let down the bed with which the paralytic lay. The four friends literally unroof the roof. And then they start to MacGyver this guy down on a pallet. In the middle of Jesus' sermon, nonetheless. And so debris is falling and dirt is falling all over people's faces as they're looking in. And there's two things I want to point out about this point of the story. Number one, the guy's friends in this instant are powerless to help the man. See, if doctors, if there were anything that the doctors could have done at this point, they would have already done it. And the four friends can't, are powerless to help. So what they do is they have to go to a higher power in the person of Jesus to look for help. God uses broken people to rescue broken people. And then the second thing I want you to see in this is that the man himself also is powerless to help himself. So not only are the friends powerless, but the, the man is, is powerless to help himself. This man being a paralytic most likely meant that he didn't have a job. It most likely meant that, that he would have set out on the street and begged friends and strangers for money. If he did have a job, he didn't make very much. 
He would have been an outcast to society. In fact, if he would have ever made the trip to Jerusalem to worship at the temple, he wouldn't have been let in because he wasn't physically whole. This guy was an outcast. Everyone looks down on him metaphorically and physically because of his sickness. And then a verse we'll see, spiritually speaking, you know, you and I, we're a lot like this man, paralyzed due to our sin. You and me, we get paralyzed because of our, because of our own sin. We're paralyzed by it, we're trapped by it. And I want you to hear this this morning. You cannot quit your sin any more than an addict can quit their abuse. It takes something more than just the power inside of you, but it takes uh, many times a power that's outside of you in the person of Christ. And so a verse like Galatians 6 will come into play and it'll say this, bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Hear this believer. If you're a believer, you are to carry, you are to be the conductors of, you are to crutch, you are to help, Carry the burden, shoulder the weight of the people around you. This isn't, this isn't like a, you come and, and go, hey man, how you doing? And you're like, well, not so good. You know, my dog just got ran over by a car and then my, my goldfish got eaten by my cat and my cat choked on my goldfish. It's been a terrible week. And we'll look in at that situation and we'll go, man, that's awful. Let me pray for you. The end. That's not the picture of Galatians 6. Instead, that, that word burden there, it means to carry a weight of personal and eternal significance. To carry the burden. It, it, it can be talking about a character flaw or it can be talking about a struggle. Now, bearing the, a, a burden of your buddy, it doesn't mean that you assume the responsibility for, for someone else's mistakes or sin, but it does mean that you come alongside of them to help them carry the weight of the trial or carry the weight of the temptation, whatever it is that's causing paralysis over them. Sometimes our burden is our friends' troubles and temptations and problems. And it's our duty, it's your duty to lend a hand, to reach out and to be a crutch. And in some instances, you know this, you've probably seen this, in some situations, we have to carry people through a full season of something that they've just went through in a struggle. God uses broken people to rescue broken people. And these four friends are working together in the same way to help one. Now, now from the text, we know as they carry, there are a lot of people there. As, as we said, there's a lot of people between the, the paralytic and Jesus. Don't miss that. Sometimes there's a lot of people between you and Jesus. Sometimes there's a lot of people between your friends and Jesus. Don't miss the people factor of this. Sometimes, sometimes people can be a great obstacle to your relationship with Christ. They can, just, they can just take up space. They can just take up time. They can be uncaring or, or unloving. Some of them can even stunt your spiritual growth with Jesus. Yet no matter the size of the crowd, these guys refuse to stop. And I mean, if you think about it, it takes a really serious commitment to dig out a man-sized hole in a stranger's roof. That takes a pretty serious commitment because what happens is if, 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 if they're wrong, they all of a sudden become the laughing stock of this small town. Or if Jesus, who's giving this sermon, looks in and disapproves of what they're doing, then all of a sudden their buddy is hanging there like a human pinata in some stranger's living room. There's a lot of risk associated with it. And I want you to picture their, their sweaty faces looking down at Jesus as they've lowered their friend. God uses broken people to rescue broken people. They refused to stop. They would not shut up. Which is actually how I got to church in the first place. I didn't grow up in the church. But there was this group of girls that kept bugging me and would not leave me alone about coming to church. And so finally, so they would be quiet, I gave in. And so I, I just want to ask you, church... Do you have the same sense of urgency to get those in your family, to get those who you love, to get your friends in front of Jesus? Don't stop. Don't stop. Tell your neighbor, don't stop. 
Now let's, let's turn our attention in this story back to Jesus. In this moment, everyone, everyone, every eye is focused in on Jesus. They are waiting to hear what he would say and watch what he would do. Check this out, verse 5. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus looks in at what they've just done. He sees, he sees their faith. And then he says to them, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now when the, the word their faith there, it's probably in reference to all five of the guys. But when Jesus addresses the paralytic as son, the Greek is child. And so Jesus immediately looks in the predicament of this man who's just been lowered down and is filled with compassion once again because of his circumstance. Jesus sees their faith and addresses them. And, and sometimes, you know, I'll talk to non-Christians um, or just Christians who are struggling and, 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 and there's this really big problem with the faith side of Christianity. And I, I want to point this out in this story. Here, faith isn't just this lofty, hypothetical thing, but faith, their faith is actually played out and it's demonstrated so much so that Jesus sees it. They, they do what they do because of what they believe. Don't miss that, church. Your faith isn't just what you believe, it's very much so about what you do with what you believe. And this is, this is really interesting to me because in this instance of this story, it appears that personal sin and sickness are married. So I want to sit down on that for just a second. In the, in the story, the, the way the language is used, it appears that, that personal sin and sickness are, are married together. And so, there's two sides of this coin. On one side, church, on one side, your struggles can be a result of your personal sin. Did you know that? can be. For example, if you, uh, if you eat every meal like it's the state fair and uh, have, take a LeBron James approach, no regard for human life when it comes to eating, and then one day you have a heart attack, well, it's because there are consequences to our actions. A scriptural example of this would have been when Paul was talking about taking communion in an unworthy manner. Check this out. He says in 1 Corinthians 11, let each person examine himself then, to eat, and then eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks it without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Listen to this. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Your sin does cut you off from the Father. If you're a Christian, I don't mean this in a salvific way, but what I do mean is that it moves you out of the center of the will of God when you sin. You and God in that moment are not on the same page. And many times when we read the scriptures, we'll see God step out of the way and let personal sin take its effect. So that's one side. Personal, your struggle can be a cause of your personal sin. Now on the, on the other side, not every struggle you go through is because of your personal sin. But, but I very much believe so that some struggles can be a result of general sin. Some struggle is a result of general sin where Adam and Eve in the garden... God created this perfect garden and Adam and Eve voted on the collective half of humanity and said, no, let's go this way. Sometimes general sin affects us. Back to my first example. You can you could be the guy or the gal who eats the perfect meals. You can work out every day. You can run five miles a day, eat right, do the right thing, get the perfect amount of sleep. You know some of those people have still had heart attacks and died? A scriptural example of this would be John uh, chapter 9. The disciples asked Jesus, said, Teacher, who sinned? Was it this guy or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus said, It wasn't that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. What I'm saying is, church, ultimately the source of our struggle is sin. Ultimately. Sometimes it's personal, sometimes it's general. But I did want you to be brave enough to ask the question in your own life, is where I'm at, is the struggle that I'm in currently because of my personal sin? Be brave enough to ask, 
ask yourself that question. This is the, the great issue that, that confronts us all. It's not a law of retribution. It's not karma. It's not bad luck. The source of the struggle is sin. Romans 3.23 says we're all in the same boat. We've all sinned and fallen short of, of God's perfect standard. And then a text like uh, John 3.36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever doesn't, does not obey the Son, shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. You can try to ignore it. You can. You can try to treat the symptoms of it, like poverty and child abuse. You can try to treat those symptoms, but the source of it really is sin. You have to treat the source. Every struggle, every hardship, the source is sin. I'm not saying that every bad thing that happens to you is the fault of your personal sin. I'm not saying that at all. But I, like I said, I do want you to consider that question. Is where I'm at and the struggle that I'm in because of my personal sin. And so knowing this, Jesus looks at the situation and he sees the physical struggle of the man. But he also sees a deeper struggle of the man. And so let me ask you, church, in this story, which does Jesus heal first? The surface level or the spiritual? Spiritual, right? He, he looks at the man and he says to him, your sins are forgiven. Even though the man needed physical healing, Jesus looks at him and says, your sins are forgiven. And as soon as Jesus says that, when those words roll off of his lips, it creates some major, major problems. Listen to this, verse 6 and 7. As he says this, now some of the scribes who were sitting there questioning in their heart, they say, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So you have this group not of just uh, 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 townspeople there, but you have this group of scribes and teachers of the law. The scribes were like the, the religious police officers, the religious law enforcement of that day. And so as soon as they hear Jesus say, your sins are forgiven, that comes off of his mouth, they immediately associate that with blasphemy. As soon as Jesus says that, they immediately associate that with blasphemy. And blasphemy, as you probably know, is the unforgivable sin. It's the, the unforgivable sin. Now, uh, we're not going to break that down fully this morning. We'll probably talk about that more when we get to Mark chapter 3. But what you need to know about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is this. It's an act of resistance that belittles God the Holy Spirit so grievously that He withdraws Himself forever. And when the Holy Spirit withdraws Himself forever, He also withdraws with Him conviction power. Jesus calls it an eternal sin. An eternal sin. And if you're wondering this morning, have I ever done that? I hope I've never done that. Well, if you're a Christian, you haven't. If you're a Christian, you cannot commit a blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Com Christians, we commit sins, but the true mark of a Christian is that they don't sit in it. They don't stay in it. We hate it. We repent of it. You may have days of sin or weeks of sin or seasons of sin, but you don't sit in it because we have Christ inside of us. And just as Christ hates sin, we hate sin too. Amen? This is a very serious charge and I want you to catch the brevity of it the weightiness of it the, 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 they respond who can forgive sins but God alone when Jesus says your sins are forgiven they immediately they know the scripture in Leviticus uh, Leviticus 24 that says that, that, um, that, that blasphemy is punishable by the death of stoning they're immediately connecting these dots in their head and make no mistake Jesus' words are blasphemous Unless, unless what he is saying is true. C.S. Lewis calls this the great trilemma of Christ. He says that when it comes to Jesus, you can't, you can't just think that he's a, a, a moral teacher or a good guy with nice things to follow and to say. No, no, no. You have to believe that either Christ, that he, he is who he says he was and that he is Lord. Or you have to believe that, that he was absolutely crazy Someone walks in here and says, hey, I'm God, and he's a lunatic, or he's a liar. He knew what he said wasn't true. So which is it for you? Is Christ the Lord, or is he a liar, or is he a lunatic? In this moment, the scribes are pointing out, and, and they are calling 
Jesus to, to blasphemy. He can't just be a moral teacher. He is either Lord, liar, or lunatic. But Pastor Johan last week walked us through the, the messianic miracles of, of Jesus, and this ties directly into that. In Jewish thinking, not even the Messiah could forgive sins. Don't miss that. These first century Jews, they knew not even the Messiah was supposed to be able to forgive sin. That was, that was bestowed for God and God alone. And so they knew exactly what he was saying. And what may be even cooler, next verse, verse 8. <laughs> and immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? The things that they were thinking in their heads and their hearts, it was almost as if they had said it out loud. Jesus knew exactly what they were saying. And so Jesus, he doesn't dismiss it, he doesn't go away from it, but he directly confronts them with, with two questions. The first one is there in verse 8. He says, why do you question these things in your heart? Church, do you know that Jesus can read your mind? Psalm 139 says that he knows our, our words before we speak them. I'll go play basketball sometimes with some guys, and I think it's kind of funny. Um, we'll be playing typically at a church somewhere, and, and someone will cuss, and, and then someone always usually typically chimes in and goes, you can't, you don't, you don't cuss in a church. And like, a, like, I get the respect part of that, but it's really just bad theology because, like, we love this building, you know, we, we, we like the building that we set in, but this building isn't the church. You're the, we're the church when we, when we get together. And so church, Jesus knows your minds and your, and your thoughts. And that's the first question. And the second question he confronts him with is in verse 9. Listen to what he says. He says, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to go rise, get up, take your bed and walk? See, Jesus knew, just as the scribes knew, is one thing to make claims about this stuff. It's totally different to actually do them. Like we can make claims about anything. I can tell you downtown there is the best baker you've ever had. Those buns, man. I can tell you all about the buns. But if you go down there and, and, and you taste the muffins and find out they're trash, my claim is all, all of a sudden shattered because it's not true. And so the scribes know this. It's one thing to say your sins are forgiven because that's invisible and impossible to prove. It's a totally another thing to look at this guy and say, get up and do the electric slide out of here. Like that proves something. And so Jesus then sets the preface to this miracle that he's about to perform. He's going, I'm doing this, verse 10, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, now Jesus here, he introduces a very important title for himself, Son of Man. It's Jesus' favorite self-designation. It's his favorite title that he uses. More so, he uses it more than Christ or Messiah. One, one reason is because uh, Messiah, meaning Christ, it has a lot of political overtones. The Jews looking in, they had this picture, as Johann told us last week, of this hero Messiah that would come, and Jesus wasn't going to operate like that. And so looking at this term, Son of Man, can help explain it a little bit. In the Old Testament, the Son of Man is used in all kinds of ways. One way I, I put down here is Psalm, uh, Psalm 144. And in, in this section, it simply means a human being. Listen to this. Lord, what is man that you regard him, or the Son of Man that you think of him? Human being. And then you'll read another text like Daniel 7, which refers to this one who would come and establish God's kingdom. Listen to this. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and he was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. Jesus uses this term, Son of Man, to refer to both connotations, that he is both fully man, and he is also fully God. He's fully man, but he's also fully God. And that's why he uses it one reason so much. See, Jesus, he would first come to suffer, and then he would come in glory. He would first come to serve, and then he would come and reign. As God incarnate, he comes and, and suffers on a cross, but one day Jesus is, is coming again, the coming King, the, the Ancient of Days, the Lord of Glory. Amen. And so Jesus, the, the full Son of Man, listen to this, 
what he's been saying all along, he backs it up. Verse 11, love it. He says, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Man. Through a visible miracle, Jesus proves that he has the power to perform the invisible miracle of forgiveness of sins. And it's in front of everyone so that they might look in and see. This is the only time throughout the entirety of the scriptures where uh, forgiveness of sin is associated with the Son of Man. And in spite of the opposition from the religious elite, man, we see an incredible ending. Verse 12. And he rose, and immediately he picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Never. They never saw anything like this. The response from the crowd and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are all appropriate. The, the, the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah 35, 6, has finally come true. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer. No one could deny that this guy had been healed by Jesus, no one could deny that his sins had been forgiven. They might not have liked it, but they couldn't deny it. Coming to Jesus, this man receives more than, than he expected, but exactly what he needed. And his buddies, they bring him to, to Jesus and set him down because they know that Jesus can heal the deepest need that he has. And they were right. They were just wrong about what that deepest need really was. It wasn't just physical healing. It was a total pardon from sin. Oftentimes we think we know what our greatest struggle is, our greatest need is, but a lot of times we're just struggling or we're just focusing on the, on the circumstances, you know. This morning your struggle really isn't your spouse, it's really not your job, it's really not your co-workers or your boss. Your greatest struggle is really not your lack of resources, it's really not your shortage of time, it's really not your insufficient income. The greatest need that we have is just like this man had, and it's that we need the Messiah, the Son of Man Himself, to pardon us of our sin. That's the, that's the greatest need. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us today. We pray that this message has challenged, encouraged, and shaped you a little more into the person that God dreamed you would be. If you've been blessed in any way through the ministry of Rest Church or you have a prayer request, we want you to go to our app under the prayer request section and submit that so we can see how God is impacting your story. We were never meant to do life alone, and so we're so thankful for a family like you to do life with. In fact, it's your generosity that's helped spread the gospel here at Rest Church. And so if you would like to give, feel free to do so by texting the word GIVE, G-I-V-E, to 270-366-7947 and follow with your dollar amount. Thank you so much for letting us speak truth into your life through God's word week to week. Have an amazing day.